Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation, Masters Week. And of all the people who have history at Augusta National, there's nobody that would rise above uh, the guy that is going to join me here in a minute to have a conversation about his own history there, about the golf course, about the club, uh, then a two-time Masters champion. That's Ben Crenshaw. You've heard me say this before. For, for all the, the, the great athletes that I've watched and enjoyed for decades and decades, there's only one that I actually lived and died with, and it was a golfer, and it was him. And there are varying reasons, various reasons why that's the case, but this conversation is going to be about his own history, which not only did he win twice, got his heart broken a couple other times, had a hell of a record there, as good as anybody for an entire decade, but also his thoughts on this golf course, which constantly evolves, has made changes. We'll get his thoughts on the, the new tee on 13 as well. My conversation with 84 in 1995, Masters champion Ben Crenshaw is next. <laughs> only a grip. It's only my sole connection to this. It's only in my hands on every single shot. It's an extra two yards of carry when it matters most. Yeah, only a grip. Mine are only golf pride. Respect the grip. With that, we welcome in a two-time Masters champion. This week will never get old for this gentleman. Ben Crenshaw, good morning. How are you? Uh, I'm very good, Gary. It's great to be back over here. Um, I've spent way, way over half a lifetime here in this great place. I was here uh, with some friends two weeks ago, and I saw you know, relatively few changes to the course itself, but... Uh, They've really done an unbelievable job on the par three course. It is, wait till people see that. It is spectacular. Uh, it's got an arena-like atmosphere now. It can accommodate a lot more people. Uh, we built three beautiful cabins up there on the hillside, but uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm sure that a lot of people have loved watching this drive, chip, and putt. That, that is such a great feature uh, here. You can see young, enthusiastic golfers, they're talented, and some of them are just amazing. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it helps start the week. You know, the players are all coming in, uh, eager to get some practice rounds in, get settled in for the week. But uh, it's a festival, Gary, as you know. It's it's all geared for this week. Hopefully the weather's good. Uh, but the course is magnificent. It looks great. It's long. It's long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, a little bit longer uh, than when you won it. And I, I want people to understand this is, you know, you get a history lesson when you when you hear the thoughts of, of Ben Crenshaw. But your history there, as you mentioned, your life, uh, a life spent going there starting in 1972. You were the low amateur, 72 and 73. In my estimation, and it's quantified, in the decade of the 80s, outside of Severiano Ballesteros, you had the best record of anybody around there uh, as somebody who lived and died with every shot. I did some dying during that decade, uh, but did some good living uh, as well. I want people, I want to take you back to a few moments, but I also want you to talk about this golf course that you know so well. Um, and it's interesting, I've heard you talk about the impression that the country club made on you when you went there with your father in the late 60s, what struck you the first time you went to Augusta National? I, it, was, it was so spacious, Gary. I, you know, I just, my father and I had read about Bobby Jones uh, in wonderful books, some of my favorite books, but his, his life um, is a wonder, wonderful, uh, uh, you know, he's a lawyer, so well-educated, uh, and I think that his campaigns in, in uh, uh, Great Britain and in Scotland, uh, I, I think it left a deep impression 
on him, especially St. Andrews. Um, and I, I just kind of remember some of those words when uh, he and Dr. McKenzie set out to build this golf course. Uh, I think he used the, the, the words, uh, we wanted a rolling inland golf course. And uh, I think that some of the features, then at least in my mind, the fifth green and the 14th green, to me, you could take those greens and put them at St. Andrews. Uh, they have, you know, very steep faces uh, on the front, which encourages a run-up shot. But uh, to me, I, I, I marvel at those two greens. I, they're, they're very special in my mind and it has to play they're very difficult but it has they have a saint andrean feel about them uh i think that it is a strategic golf course and it's 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 a little bit ironic that the course really does not punish high handicappers so much there's plenty of space out there but it's amazing how the way the bunkering is and the way the slopes are uh, players of this caliber are trying to get to a certain spot and then open up angles to the greens. And that's, that's one of the great features about it. Yes, it's very spacious. And uh, it, I think it sort of escapes the imagination of people playing it for the first time. They say, wow, it's so, and it's so, uh, it has, it's so slopey. You, you know, when, when you see it for the first time, you, you go out and look at the first hole and it just plunges down in this valley and then back up. And that's very much a feature of the ninth hole coming back uh, up to the clubhouse and then the 18th. Uh, and then on the side of that, number 10 is one of the most gorgeous holes in the world. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, when you really think of it, I don't think they moved a lot of dirt, let's say, in construction. They really let the land speak for itself. And they did it in a, a beautiful, unique way. And it's it's a little bit taxing for an older golfer to get around <laughs> because it's so hilly. But it's um, it's greens and their bunkers and their, their entrances are just fascinating. And they're You've got to have a great, great touch uh, to get around. I, I've always said to Gary, there's almost no way to prepare uh, when you go out and see it for the first time, and you, you, in practice, you, you, you imagine a couple of balls on the side of the greens, and you, you practice and you hit those. And it always seemed to me that uh, in playing in the tournament. You get up to a ball and you say, you know, I haven't had this shot before. So you have to, it's a great deal of imagination uh, that you have to have because the slopes are, are pretty severe. And uh, you, you always think in your mind to try the high line because they can, they can break off so, so quickly and go underneath the hole. But uh, you have to really imagine uh, the line of the ball it has to be the proper strength as well. Those little delicate little chips, you know, and it's, um, yeah, I think most people say it's it really conducive to power. There's no doubt power has its reward here, but it's the little shots that I think are, are so uh, delicate, but it's something that you have to have uh, to retrieve a shot uh, that you've misplayed. So, uh, it really, when you, when you get the ball up and down from the side of the green, it really lifts your spirits. Believe me, it does. You, um, I mentioned, you know, the way you started your career there, you know, you weren't just the low amateur. You finished inside the top 25, those, those two years, you finished second in 1976. Ray Floyd was simply better than everybody else, uh, that week. And then when the decade of the eighties started, you finished sixth, eighth, 24th, second in 1983. What were you solving? Were there things that you were figuring out? And if, if you were figuring things out, what were you figuring out? Yeah, I think when you, when you see the course the first time, there's so much to take in. Uh, you try to envision how you're going to play the holes. And I had a, 
I had a wonderful old guy named Luke, who was my first caddy from 1972 to 1975. And then um, there were two members uh, who, who were good friends of mine, uh, John Griffith from Fort Worth, and uh, actually Jack Stevens uh, from Little Rock, who said, you know, there's a guy here. Actually, Carl Jackson had caddied many years for, for Mr. Stevens. And they said, maybe maybe it's it might be a good idea to change caddies. Carl was very studious. Uh, he knows the course well. And we, yeah, my first year, 1976, Carl really made me study the golf course. And he, alongside what he was trying to put into my game, uh, he'd say, let's try this shot. Let's try this putt over here uh, for that pin. He really... It really dug in, and 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 we really studied it together, and we we had a we were making a great team, you know. Not second in 1976, albeit by eight shots that <laughs> Raymond beat us all. You know, I tell you what, Gary, I, I always remember Raymond. Uh, he had a he had a club that he he purchased from Tony Penna, who was a great old club maker. He got a he got a ladies five wood a ladies five wood, and he reshafted that that wood, and he played the par fives that so well that year. I mean, he was making eagles and birdie in the par fours as as he he wanted to in his mind. He just played magnificent the whole time. Eight shots. What a what a margin. What a nice feeling. <laughs> Uh, coming up the 18th fairway with eight shots, but uh, we finished a distance second and uh, kind of won my own little tournament, but it was getting closer, but I, I felt like it was capable. Uh, so it was always something to, when, when Augusta rolled around, uh, you know, all of us get so excited to play it. You, 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 you put yourself to the test. You know, one thing, Gary, is that, the winner this week, uh, you can't win this tournament playing safe. You you just it, you the numbers of that uh, other people will post. You've got to take chances. You have to take chances. Augusta goads you into make into taking those chances, uh, and that's it. There's it's a very very fine line of shots that you attempt. And uh, all of us have failed spectacularly on certain shots. You either hit it in the water or you do this or that. It's one of the most emotional golf courses in the world to play uh, when you're in contention because it's your your emotions are so high. But uh, it's a great thrill to bring a shot off when you have to. Uh, but and there's no way to to gain. Uh, or to get ahead if you play safe. You you have to take some chances. 1984, um, the, the week you were right in the thick of it. You were the 18-hole leader. You were inside the top three after 18 holes, 36 holes, 54 holes. So you were in the throes of it. Um, I I know in my mind a handful of shots that, that stick out from that Sunday. Um, is there one that rises above all the others, or is it just kind of a collage of shots that were the, were the central theme of how you did it on that Sunday in 84? Yeah, there's no question. I had, uh, uh, at, through the turn, I was playing well, excited, and then the 10th hole came. And I, the 10th hole, uh, I had a so-so drive, and I had a three-iron to the green. Uh, and I hit it about 60 feet from the cup. I was on the right side of the green. The pin was back. And I told myself, if I could just two-putt this and, and go on, I'd be so happy. But unbelievably, that ball went in the cup. And I just, I was, I, it took me two holes to calm down after that putt. I couldn't <laughs> believe that putt went in. Uh, but I got through, uh, Got you know, Tim, we got, got through 12 and made a birdie at 12. Um, Penn was back right, and I made about a 15-footer for a two there. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the shot that really calmed me down 
quite a bit was on the 14th. Yep. Uh, I had a, had a really bad approach shot to the top of the green and the pin was down on the right uh, where it is usually on Sunday. And I had a really poor first putt about 15 feet short of the short and to the left of the cup. And I made that putt for my second putt. And it was just, Oh, I, you know, I just couldn't afford a, a bogey or a three putt or something really negative at that point. And when that putt went in, I thought, well, maybe this is my day. If I can just somehow that week, I held my emotions pretty well. I'm, I'm as I can, my mind can wander quite a bit and, um, I get upset with myself. Every, every golfer does, but, uh, somehow it didn't infect me that much. Uh, which is like I say, it's a little unusual for me. I'm usually very up and down with my emotions, but that two putt really calmed me down on 14. So, uh, figured if I can, uh, get in from there, it was, it was going to be my, my day. And it was, and I, you know, if you look at that decade, and if anybody goes back and watches, which is great, you can do that on YouTube, these these final round broadcasts, the network broadcast. By the way, on 14, I believe it was Frank Gleber who was calling the action on 14, and Venturi stepped in when you hit your second shot to the top of the green on the left-hand side. He said, it's the last place he wants to be. Oh, God. And, <laughs> it just impossible putt down it's down the staircase, you know, that green is, is so, is so steep. It's so far above the hole. And I had to just touch it to roll it down. I didn't hit it hard enough. Uh, and I left myself a really tough right to left breaker, uh, for that second putt, but it's, uh, uh, I just couldn't afford to lose a stroke there. You were in the last group, 87, 88, 89. And for all the heartbreak that that Greg Norman experienced in his career there, I think because you had already won, um, you know, and, and some of what happened to him, yeah, it was dramatic, certainly what happened in 96. But I can point to a couple things. Did 87 or 89, did one or the other wound you more? Because I have one that wounded me more. They both were, they felt fatal at the time uh, because you didn't cross the line. Did one or the other year hurt more? I, th I think I remember um, those years. Uh, maybe it was '88. I was playing with Roger Maltby the last round, and, and that was '87. You were with Sandy okay. Lyle in '88. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember Roger and I could not get our approach shots close enough to the hole. The, the greens were very firm that year. I remember, and it was they were very skiddy. Let's say. And uh, we were faced with 30, 35 foot putts that you never expect to make that much. And we couldn't make any headway, but that was uh, 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 Larry Mize's year. Yep. Uh, and with Greg Norman pursuing. Um, and, you know, it's this year, uh, two, two guys are retiring this year, Gary, and it's Larry Mize and Sandy Lyle. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to make mention of them both at, at the dinner on Tuesday night. Uh, I played with Sandy Lyle the last day when he won. Yes. And uh, I'm telling you, everybody remembers the fairway bunker shot that he hit on 18, which was one of the great shots I've ever seen. It took someone of Sandy's strength to hit that ball out of the, the deep bunker. You know, they'd redone it. It's very deep. And he hit this ball and just hit it so hard and it skyrocketed out of there. And I said, God, look at this shot, Carl. It's going, it went up on the green and he made the putt. But you have to have a really strong back to hit that shot like he did. But I'll tell you one shot, though, that I'll always remember. One of the greatest shots I've ever seen at Augusta. The fourth hole, the par three, he hit it over the green. There used to be a water fountain uh, back there. Uh, you walked up uh, to the fifth tee box and the Sandy's ball was close to that water fountain and the pin was back, right. And I mean, it was one of the difficult shots I've ever seen. He, he made that shot. He hit this beautiful little chip and run on the top of the green and it just got on the green and it, 
it went in on the last turn. It was just one of the great shots I've ever seen. Uh, I made a two, uh, but he played, he was playing so well at that time. I'll tell you, he so strong. He hit, played a lot of uh, tee shots with a one iron. He had this pin yes. one iron that he loved. And, uh, you know, on the 18th hole, he barely pulled that his tee ball and he, he kind of, Kicked the ground because he knew it might go into that bunker, and it did. But uh, I tell you, it was one of the great shots I've, I've seen up ben, on the green. But before we get to 95, I want to mention 89 because, you know, it, you mentioned Larry Mize. Larry posted in 87. He was out in front of the last groups. In 89, Faldo did the same thing. He was out in front of, of you guys. You were playing with Scott Hoke. Awful weather on Sunday. Um and and you make the birdie on 16. It was raining so hard, your your Nabisco visor was coming apart at the seams. You were you were ready to pull the trigger, and you stepped out and tossed it aside toward Carl with your left hand. Step back in. You make that on 17. I want people to understand. You hit a fairway wood into the 17th green. You hit a poor tee shot, short and left. You hit fairway wood, and and the camera. Like it was just the behind the, the the green camera was just stationary, and all of a sudden this ball lands on the green, and Vern Lundquist went, "Wow, that's a hell of a shot!" <laughs> and you had about thirty what, feet, we, two breaks, I, I, <laughs> incredible. Carl, Carl, and I were so wet. I, I mean, there was one square inch uh, of either of us who, who weren't just drenched. You know, I, I skied that tee ball on seventeen. Uh, I didn't have a good hold on the club and I skied it and <laughs> left myself a four wood into the green <laughs> and hit it up there. And somehow I made that putt. I, oh my gosh. That gave us a chance, uh, up 18. And I hit a fat second shot of five iron or something. And I bogeyed the hole. I just messed, messed up. But, uh, uh, oh, that was a wet day. It was one of those rain days where the water was just coming straight down and, uh, you got a drop on 18 fairway. You were in casual water. You hit a good drive. I do want to mention, I don't know if you remember this. You you hit a, that second shot on 17. Hoke hit it long and right. He hit one of the most remarkable short pitches that skidded, and he left himself about five feet to keep the lead, and he missed it. You make yours. He missed his, so it's a two-shot swing. I honestly think if he'd made that and gone on and won, that third shot on 17 would stand up as one of the great recovery shots uh, under the circumstances I've ever seen. Um, but you were I agree. I mean, it was great. It was incredible. Pitch. It really was. Uh, and that, you know, that green, I think to me, Gary, that's one of the most unsung greens yes. over here. Uh, it's an unbelievably pitched green and it really escapes your imagination getting the right pace of of any putt there and especially if you're putting from left to right because it, it that goes it slope goes down to Ray's creek but scott's ball was past the pin but he had to hit this really delicate shot he hit it just right just right it had this had the exact proper action on the ball that went mm. over there it was it was a great shot let me get a couple thoughts on on 1995. Uh, it was a you know it was a very challenging week with Harvey's passing, and you you come back. You've talked about this at length about you know expectations low, um, but there was something Carl saw with you with respect to your ball position that week, and it was a tip that he gave you, and all of a sudden you start flushing it. As the week progressed, it's hard. It's easy to temper expectations early. But then, all, but you're not going away. What were you doing as far as managing expectations as the week progressed? Well, I think to me it was a relief uh, to play a really good round in the first round because I had missed the cut in New Orleans and wasn't playing well. You know, and we came back. We made this plan to to go back to Austin, Texas, to bury Harvey, a long time friend and and teacher uh but it, for some reason we came back to augusta and i went out on the practice tee and we had this wonderful session carl and i did and he mentioned two things he said i want you to put that ball further back in your stance and try to make a tighter turn with your shoulders 
and I started hitting the ball crisply and a little bit much better than I had been. So I had these simple thoughts, you know, they were, you know, two simple thoughts that way. And I started about the first five balls, I started gaining confidence. And I was eager to try to put that into play on, on the first day. And I played some really good shots and, and, and uh, I came back, you know, on the first day I came with some really positive thoughts and I was eager to, to try to keep that going throughout the week. And it just kept building and I kept hitting some good shots and really did not have any extemporaneous thoughts going through my head. Like, I, like, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us, we, we, uh, have a have a thought and we want to seize upon it and sometimes you get cluttered in your mind and but you you kind of keep your rhythm and keep your tempo and the balance and it was working and it it uh, I was playing well and I kept kept those thoughts simply uh in those in in the third day and then the last day I had some great breaks but I was playing confidently and had a something made me um, keep my emotions in check too. And I, you know, it's, I never thought about Harvey until I was coming up the 18th hole. And I said to myself, I can't believe this is happening this week, <laughs> this particular week. But something made me, Gary, play like a kid. Something made I play. I just it was like I had no thoughts. I was playing my favorite course in the world, and in the in 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 a, the arena of of importance. And, and something made me. It was I had a I had a calm. I had a calm, an inner calm. And uh, I <laughs> daydreamed about it a million times, but uh, I it was. Some, something allowed me to play some of my best golf on that occasion and had simple thoughts as that when I was young. And, uh, but I, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it happened. It was, uh, it's interesting. You're really, every player, if they play enough times, they're going to have a relationship with, with certain holes. Your relationship with 14, the par you made, uh, in, in 84 on Sunday, the break off the tee in 95 could have kicked down, could have had a, a, a worse look at, at, at the green from where you hit a fabulous, I think it was eight iron to that back right pin just went beyond the green surface. You left it right in the throat uh, with your birdie putt. But that was, I thought that th that was a critical moment. And, and then, you know, the iron shot you hit on 16, like these, these, yeah. these particular, that is, you, you know, you you took that back pin on several times. You did it in '89. You did it again in '95. I thought 14 and 16 were huge. Yes, I. You know, it's funny when uh, we got through the 15th hole, went to 16, and you know, Davis Love had posted a great round, and I knew that we needed one more birdie to get ahead of it. And it was something I, we walked onto the tee and we had a little bit of a following wind that day. And I, the choice of club was so crystal clear. It was unbelievable. I, I, it was a, it was a six iron, just, just a, a really simple, good hit. I knew it was a, plenty of club and you know, you just played that ball out to the right. And, uh, but it was it was like the selection of club was just crystal clear. We didn't even think one minute about it. And uh, that ball finished up there by the hole, and I made that putt. And I said, all right, that's one shot. And then the 17th, I, I just yeah. it was, made a wonderful three there. Good tee ball. And then a, I think I played a nine iron up there. And I made a difficult putt. And uh, – but that God, what a feeling of relief that was. <laughs> yeah, you had, you had you had a couple shot I, leads the the two years that you won it. I, I know lo people love when you talk about this golf course. I love when you go on Golf Channel on Live From and they kind of walk you through some stuff that you'll do later this week. Uh, hopefully, you're going to do it again. Um, when when they made the the significant changes after the turn of this century. 
um, you know, it wasn't just yardage that was added. Um, looks of holes became very different. Which hole in your estimation after 2002 took on the, the most profound change as far as the optics of it? Well, obviously, people's attention would be, will be riveted this week about the 13th tee, and it's yes. something to see. Uh, I played a couple of weeks ago, and I must say, Gary, I walked back there <laughs> did not play it. <laughs> but it is, to me, it's sort of right in today's of modern play, they could not have done it any better. And it was the proper thing to do. You know, you know, I guess, unfortunately, they had to purchase land from Augusta Country Club yeah. to, to do this thing. But that tee is way elevated. It's way up there and it's back. But when you look down the fairway to the landing area, it's it's exactly what uh, it's, it's a test. It's a modern test. And the temptation, Gary, is to try to turn that ball over and get extra yardage from right to left. It's, 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 that's how the, we used to play that hole uh, in yesteryear. And it is very visual because the tee is so high and, and, but that temptation will be there. And that's, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, there's going to be, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's dry, you know, so people can, uh, if they hit a great, T-ball, you know, then they can go for the green. That's when it gets exciting. Uh, but it is back there. That's the way it should be for these for these players. You know, it's hard to believe, Gary, that now we have people over half the players can carry the ball 300 yards. Yep. It's just unfathomable to me. That's the way it is, though. Um, uh, but – the daring and the tempting is is always there. I, I've I've always said Augusta's the most tempting golf course in the world, uh, on so many different shots, just like thirteen, and and just you you the shot a lot of times is fairly clear, but you know certain undulations can do this or that to the ball. And you, you say to yourself, well, I th think today my swing's good enough to get it over there. And, uh, sometimes you, you, sometimes you gain and sometimes you fail. I tell you what, there's one little change that people will notice. Uh, and the players is number 11. Mm. Number 11 is so long now. It's very long, but they've, uh, put a, it's sort of an innocent looking undulation to the right of the green where it used to be sort of dead flat ground. Now there's a, a little undulation or a little uplift that encompasses the right edge of the green. And if you hit a ball, you'll slip off to the right and it'll be about three, three and a half feet lower. So you have to hit this little pitch and towards the water and mm -hmm. it's enough to bother you. Which, which is really it's, it's it's wonderful it was not you know not too much but just enough to put a thought in your head you got to execute a good pitch there so things like that i think are are wonderful augusta has always been right on top of things like that to make it interesting interesting is 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 the key word there you, you know ben you mentioned hole number five earlier and now with with you know the digital experience and now you see 18 hole coverage you didn't see the fifth hole much uh, back in the day and now you can now you can really examine it and there are features that that obviously mckenzie there is there are, there's a tribute to some degree to the road hole um that hole right. is a grown-up hole um oh. and and it is you know, I, I think about the, the evolution of, of the golf course, but that hole in particular, just give me your thoughts on, on that hole through the years and, and, and just the challenges that hole presents. Hey, Gary, when we played it for so many years, there used to be one bunker on the left side of the fairway, and it it is at the top of a slope, and if you hook the ball more, you could miss that bunker and go down the hill. But there was one bunker there that – the the tee ball, if you turned it, the slope of the ground would carry you right into that bunker. Now there's two massive bunkers and the actual 
they force the play to the right of those bunkers and makes the whole play longer. And you can't gain the angle to the green as, as well as you could in the older days. Uh, in the older days, if you hit the ball solid, you could carry that bunker unless you had a big headwind. Uh, but now uh, you're so right because Bobby Jones used to say that, you know, obviously anybody who plays St. Andrews, number 17, the road hole is one of their favorite holes. Uh, and he wanted to, to uh, he and Dr. McKenzie wanted to depict a certain angle to, to the, uh, such a tough green, you know, the road hole swings from right to left into that green well, five is slopes left to right. And it gathers that way. So it's, it's just an unbelievable green. Uh, but it, the hole has changed demonstrably and it is a hard hole. Anybody that makes a four on that hole in any situation is very happy. Uh, <laughs> It is really a tough hole. You know, you get a little south wind into you. It's a dare. Yeah. When you won in 95, I know you know this. Jack Nicholas made two twos on that <laughs> hole that week. He made a two on Thursday and made a two on Saturday. He was 55. I don't care if you're 25. Yeah, there's only two players in Masters history that have made two eagles in the same week on par fours. How about that? <laughs> I mentioned this to somebody uh, a couple of days ago, and they said, no, you've got to be kidding. I said, no, I'm telling you, he made two twos that week. I, I mean, how about that? And, you know, people are really uh, very happy when they make a four. He made two twos. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the 10th hole, and the 10th hole is, to me, from the tee is the most majestic thing you, you can see. Uh, you, you know, you're going to start your walk down to the bottom of the golf course, which you're going to reach uh, in two holes. Um, but, but the origin of that hole, the McKenzie bunker, the influence of Perry Maxwell, just g give everybody some thoughts on, on that hole. Yeah, that's uh, that bunker down past the landing area is the last remaining original bunker, I believe. Uh, and it's uh, that the tee shot sort of depicts the thoughts of so many shots out there. You, if you hit a certain ball with the right amount of turn, you really gain a lot of yardage. Uh, and it, the undulations help you, you know, them and you got to bring the shot off. I mean, you know, if you push the ball a little bit, it, it hangs up there and it really, elongates the second shot and to try to to hit a long second shot from the right side of the fairway is really difficult because the green slopes from right to left. Um, Perry Maxwell, you know, worked with Dr. McKenzie many years. They were affiliated together. Uh, Perry Maxwell also worked on the seventh, yep. seventh hole, uh, which is, that's a bear now too. They put oh. that team way back on seven where it used to be a drive and a pitch. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a lot longer now, but his bunker arrangement there is, 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 is remarkable. It's like, it's like a trademark from McKenzie. You see uh, his bunker arrangements were unusual, but, and that green is something they've redone the green. They've softened the contours just slightly on, on number seven. Um, uh, totally regressed. Uh, but I think one of the biggest changes, like you, like you say, Gary, is the, the I think it was 1937 when Perry Maxwell built that new green on that hillside. It's a, it's a great, great hole. It was a great change because the old green used to be down over the big bunker to the right. It was sort of a, in a bowl. Mm -hmm. But man, this, that green perched up there is, is, <laughs> there's there's a lot of things that can happen on that and you, you, well that's one of the other holes too where if you make a four you're very happy usually the um the last hole i want to get your thoughts on um and again it's 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 underrated i mentioned your history you've talked about 13 already a little bit 14 i i always implore people 
if you're going to go there and you want to spend a half a day and see some interesting stuff, sit behind the 14th green, get a lawn chair, and, and just just look at it, study it, and then watch the way players have to try to manage it. Um, I think it's one, and I've talked to Gil Hans about this, that it's one of the great green complexes anywhere in the world. Uh, just, just your thoughts on that 14th green. I, I totally agree. I, I'm very much, uh, 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 I love, love that, that green. It, it's a piece of art. It really is a great piece of art. And for most people who go see it the first time, you just, you just say, God, look at the slopes, look at the <laughs> upward slope. And then what's beautiful is that in the middle of the green, in the middle front, there's these very slight little plateaus, uh, that, that move the ball this way and that, and to know to how to play that green, you have to really know it. You know, the one day that the pin is in the back and it's in a little basin back there and you'll see a lot of close shots that particular day but that's believe me the only part of that green where you can expect to get one in there obviously the the left pin is is more difficult than people think and then the right pin the right down on the bottom is just just a devil uh so many really good shots come up just a little short and then you're faced with a just a diabolical two putt up that slope and then you go up that slope and then it, the ball just goes racing down to Ray's Creek. The, to get the proper touch on that putt is really difficult, really difficult. Yeah, the other thing, Ben, about that hole, it's the only hole in the golf course that there's there's not one single bunker. And I think it's a challenging look from the tee that, that the fairway can't in the opposite direction that the hole flows. Um I, I think it's, again, I, I think the whole thing is you kind of work your way in a different direction, uh, away from 13, kind of back up. You're rising up a little bit to, to get up to 15 before you, you bottom out again down there at 16T. I think 14 is very underrated. Historically, in terms of what's happened there and, and, the, and the whole itself is the examination of the design. Well, I, I think you're right. And it's interesting you picked up on that because 14 – the tee ball, as you say, it slopes left to right. The rise of the fairway slopes left to right. But, you know, it on the tee, it almost caused, uh, caused for a draw shot to hold the fairway and not let that ball get away right way right. But, you know, most people in architecture think if, if a hole bends a certain way, then you know, then the whole hole goes that way. But this is a little opposite. You know, you, it this hole uh, goes against the slope, let's say, and goes back uh, away. Sometimes you see, a, a, it was like the opposite of 13. 13 yes. does go, go right to left, and the hole goes right to left, but 14 is a hole where it slopes the other way, and then it, it's, it's, it's different. So uh, it's, it's a problematic tee ball. Yeah, it's you know it's back there pretty good. They back that tee up a, a little bit too, but a little bit elusive. If, if the ground gets firm, a ball can really get away on on the right, and then you overdo it and you hit it on the left, and then you've got a really tough second shot. Let me um, let me get you out of here with these five quick questions. Um, the first one, and it's hard to identify one. Do you have the, the proudest shot you've ever struck in your career? Is there one that stands above all the others in terms of whether it was the, the weightiness of the moment or, or just overall, just the proudest shot you've ever struck there? Uh, I, I probably, it will always be for me the, the long putt I made on the 10th hole yeah. the last day. I mean, it was a, some bombastic putt, really. I couldn't believe that ball went in. As Bob Murphy uh, said, that's the greatest putt I've ever seen. He was, <laughs> and you, 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 you gestured like you needed to get off the green. You kind of ran the last couple steps and hopped off the putting surface. People don't realize it. Everyone thinks that Jordan Spieth is very demonstrative. He is, but you were equally as much of a cat on a hot tin roof as he was. Oh, well, let me tell you, I, my thought was I stole one or two shots there. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> got a, like I stole something and ran away with it. That's that's how I felt. God. All right. What is what is the best view of the course from the course? Wow. Um, I, I probably. When people see that tenth hole, it just it's something pretty spectacular. Uh, I think, you know, Jones used to write about it. You know, his cabin was very close by the tee. And he said that he could sit for hours and enjoy that view. And he I think he said something about uh the trees are so tall in the back of the green, they said reminded him of some gothic spires. Mm or something and uh but uh it's remarkable it says a lot about the property but it's a singular hole that sort of lingers in people's memory there's so many good looks across the course uh uh the second hole when you play the tee shot and you start walking down the hill yes. you see the golf course in the back you know it just it sprawls the land sprawls at you yeah, that that you're right about too. You turn that corner, and it's like the curtain has been pulled open, and the yeah. whole thing presents itself. All right, what what is your favorite all-time champions dinner that you were not hosting as the past champion, and now you were the steward of that wonderful event, which you will be again this year? What's your favorite all-time champions dinner? Uh wow, that's a, that's a good one. Um, you know, I'll tell you this. When I won in 84, you hit, still had to order from the menu. So we got steak and chicken from, from the clubhouse. And then in 1985, when Sandy Lyle won, you could, you could import <laughs> food or your choices. And I'll never forget Sandy's. He brought haggis in from Scotland. And it was amazing. He had his kilts on. And uh, they brought this thing out, and I think he had a, you know, a scabbard, a sword, and he opened it up, and we're going, God. And, uh, <laughs> uh, there's so many exotic menus that we have. You know, when VJ Singh won, we, yes. we had Fijian menu. It was unbelievable. Uh, I, there's so many beautiful ones. Uh, uh, Adam Scott yep. had what was what was called botany bay bugs and it was certain little shrimp from from australia it was just tremendous <laughs> so uh, scotty's got a wonderful menu that people have seen yep scotty scheffler is uh uh first of all he could repeat yes he, he could really really i'm just uh, first of all i like him so much personally obviously i'm a longhorn and a texan but he's playing such magical golf and his uh, got a great countenance about him. Uh, it's not excitable. He's, he's doing everything pretty well, but he's got a well-rounded menu there on Tuesday night. So he certainly does. He certainly <laughs> does. Let me finish with this. The design feature on that golf course, anywhere, any hole that tickles you the most, what is it? Oh, I can almost pick any green, any green out there to me. They're beautifully done. They're natural. They're shaped in an unusual way. Uh, you know where you are. You're at Augusta and you know the thoughts that Bobby Jones and Dr. McKenzie and Perry Maxwell had were synonymous of they had this wonderful piece of ground and they knew what to do with it. And I'll never forget Herbert Warren Wynn, who was, I think, the greatest American golf writer. He said to me one day, he said, you know, they knew what to leave out rather than put in. And I went, wow, that's a great statement. Mm. And in other words, it's, it's not so unadorned. It's natural. It makes you know where you are. And uh, it's 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 like one of a kind. It's it's spectacular. It's spectacular. Listen, you're awfully kind, gracious to take this much time. Um, you mentioned that to you use the term festival. 
that's what it is. It, it is just that for this game. I also know that it's, it's a celebration for you, Julie, your friends, uh, how much you cherish going back there every year. Have a great week there. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome, Gary. My pleasure. My pleasure. Have a great week watching everyone. As you can tell, I, I kind of invested a little bit of time as a kid uh, living and dying with Ben Crenshaw. If you enjoyed going down memory lane, I hope you did. I did. Most importantly, I always appreciate a conversation with him about anything associated with the game of golf. A couple of reminders. If you go to our website every day at fiveclubsgolf.com, I'm going to be doing a daily master's diary from site. Uh, so every single day, including the tournament days, you can look for that each night, my daily diary at fiveclubsgolf.com. And a reminder, next week, Andy Roddick will be in studio with Johnson Wagner and Brendan DeYoung. Uh, he just came off actually playing pickleball on live television a couple of weeks ago. But he is an avid golfer, so a reminder that that show is coming up next week. But most importantly, thanks for taking the time. Enjoy the Masters, everybody. Everybody.